when the people came here to, to start setting up vineyards, they were effectively looking at soil, and soil was their major sort of driver as to where they put vineyards. Vic Patrick, uh, who was the national sort of vineyard director of Mildara Bless, I remember him saying that uh, he would rather um, start a new region on good soil than uh, plant, say, in Coonawarra on inferior soil. And I'm only saying it's inferior there because the eyes had been picked out of Coonawarra well before. It was a bit of a gold rush and a boom, and uh, we really set about the business of trying to, to plant vineyards uh, strategically with uh, the best clonal mixes, uh, the, utilising some of the site selection stuff that we'd all learned about in, in our training. To go through that boom, uh, which we'll never see that boom again. It was damn special. I'm not sure where I've got the energy to do it. No, I wouldn't be able to do it again, no. But <laughs> Young fellas stuff for sure. Yeah, but, uh, it, it was just amazing times. Just amazing times and uh, yeah, it's a yeah, special time. The first time I set foot on Rattenbully was vintage 1974 because the Pender family, Patrick Pender and Susie Pender, who was a rival, had developed a vineyard at the southern end of Rattenbully. My father's family had been involved in wine growing in the early days and uh, so I think that's why I wanted to get into it. It must have been almost 20 years because I see our last vintage is 91 and we established it in 7071. It was the little bit of soil in an area we called the quarry that really was terra rossa over lime. You could see it where the land had broken on the quarry face. Possibly our grazing neighbours thought we were a little mad, but um, we sold our fruit in Coonawarra and it all went very well from that point of view. We sold to uh, different people um, and um, first we sold to Woodleys um, and uh, we sold to, oh look I forget, but to a lot of different people over the years and it was always labelled as Coonawarra fruit in those days. It had a history, I think for eight years out of ten it was always selected for Wynn's Black Label. So. You know, Rattenbully's had a history of producing very good fruit that was capable of going into the to the top Kunawara blends at the legal 15% or less um, since the mid-1970s. And the other vineyard that was of interest was at Joanna. I'm not sure what year that was planted, but... Um, that was planted by a guy named Greenshields. I looked for two or three years around Coonawarra for suitable soil and even at that stage there was a lot of black soil and there wasn't a lot of red left. The agent had a, a friend, Harold Langaludicke, who had a um, farm out there at Joanna and uh, so he sort of said, oh well, I've got a bit, of, a bit of a corn and paddock, I'll sell it to you if you like. That was 1975. And uh, so I had it soil tested and uh, um, we ended up buying it. Catnook Estate out of Coonawarra. They did all the, the contract vineyard establishment in the early days because I was overseas working. And um, came back in 82 and uh, did some more planting myself. Uh, Merlot and Cabernet Franc and some Riesling. And we couldn't really irrigate because the water was a bit too salty um, so we had to do everything dry land so everything took longer to grow so we established our vineyard dry land um, it took five years. In the early days we'd get uh, Catnock uh, made the wines under contract and uh, Bowen Estate did some and we used to sell fruit as well. It's astounding to see what's been done in 15 years because um, the first 20 or so years you know after Penders and ourselves were here. Um, you, know, you felt pretty, pretty isolated and alone, just with two vineyards. And then in 1990, you know, all hell broke loose, and uh, they just you know, vineyards popping up everywhere. I think I spent basically two or three years in a car driving around the southeast. I'd, I'd drawn a line from Narracourt across. To Pad a, a Maricord across to Kingston 
and, and decided that that would be the absolute northern limit because it was starting to get too hot or too sandy or too saline or whatever north of that line. It boiled down to the fact, I think, that, that Rattenbully had very, very good terrorosa soils in, in parts, particularly on the Narrakut range. Um, it had a good water supply, not as good as Coonawarra, but it had a good water supply. Um, it was relatively close to existing processing centres and it had essentially the same climate as Coonawarra. So our, our choice was Rattenbully and we started to look seriously at properties in the Rattenbully region in the, the mid-90s. Essentially our formula was, and it was very simple, um, find out what the going rate is for farmland in Rattenbully, double it and make the offer. I had a um, thousand acres of irrigation and we finished up arriving at a price and selling it and they took over in the 1st of July 1993. The reason we purchased um, Ken Schultz's property first is that he'd been a, a very big um, small seeds grower with a large water licence. So that became the base for us to have a land bank and a water bank so that we could then go out and purchase satellite properties that were reasonably close to the Schultz holding. And Vic said to me, would you be interested in staying here, staying in your house and turning this whole place into a big vineyard? We took the strike rate of a normal nursery from 65% to 95%. He was so impressed and the growth was so vigorous uh, that he finished up closing all the company nurseries down and we grew all the nurseries. And by the year 2000, we got up to planting 850,000 in the nursery. It became a big industry. You, know, you go from 40 foot wide machinery back to 2.1 metres in, the, in vineyards. It was a hell of a learning curve, you know, to come back narrow. But anyhow, we, we developed over row equipment and uh, still had that wide broad acre flare. Then we planted the Shiraz first. Uh, it was 300 acres, I think, at Guthrie's. And then we went on to plant the Cabernet and the Petite Verdot. We did all of the stapling of the posts uh, as well, and then we ran all the triclon, and we had to um, put all the jiffy clips on the, the triclon. Um, so it was, it, was quite, it was quite amazing, really. We, just, we all loved it. It was really good fun. The three of us had to be on a water cart, and one would be on the tractor, and two on hoses, just watering as we are going along. And so we hand watered all of those vines three times in that first year before, before we could um, have the triclon connected. I represented a corporate interest then uh, with Hardy's, and they were looking to expand into some uh, good red Terrarossa country. Uh, the Rattenbully region offered that up at a a uh, real opportunistic sort of level in terms of water availability and the, the soil types that they were chasing. We were pretty confident that we could do Cabernet and Chardonnay reasonably well because they're strong, <coughs> strong points. Shiraz is also common to, to the region, so those three big varieties are what the region got planted to. And just after we started, uh, Merlot came into the picture as um, another wine company focused on Merlot. So uh, you had the big four and, and that made it exciting in its own right. So you had best practice sort of stuff going on. I mean it was pretty glitzy, big bulldozers, lots of trucks, lots of, lots of action. Um, lots of expenditure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah big budgets that I'd never yeah. handled before. Yeah, exactly. Um, wondering how on earth we were going to try and meet our our commitments is uh, when when you're looking at, I don't know, it would have been a couple of thousand dollars a day in machinery working for months on end, uh, you never knowing where the end point was, that was always pretty challenging. I made the decision then to, to leave corporate and, and shift it up here and then just started off um, only doing, uh, let's see, it was about uh, 
30 acres, I think it was. I think it was, no, 40 acres at the time. I'll go back to acres back then. Uh, for a Lambie Wine Company, which was the first one, and Coonawarra Land Holdings. Obviously the land was available, it was reasonably cheap, of course, compared to Coonawarra. Um, so, sort of tucked in behind the big boys then, as um, um, you know, Smith and & Hooper and, and Hardy's all came through, and uh, Mildara Blast, so uh, we thought, well, I'm going for the ride. I didn't want to miss out on a bit of the gold rush at the time. And uh, yeah, then it just grew at an amazing rate of knots. And we've got height and we've got breadth, we've got every soil type just running one to the other and back again. So it gives in viticulture that, um, whereas in a cropping situation that could be really annoying, in viticulture it's just a perfect combination. The climate was good to put in such expensive infrastructure and you could plant up a very tiny bit of land that added another income for when sheep were down or um, you know prices were down elsewhere. We went through a different cycle, I think, in agriculture, um, and it wasn't until '94 when this vineyard and uh, well, not this one in particular, but. Mildara and um, Hardy's came into the area and planted in, in a, quite a big way that a few of us as locals decided it might be good to get back involved. Uh, I think, and the main reason for that was they were offering very good contracts at the time. The following year, 1995, Yolumba started planting next to our property, my property, and my brother and a friend we split a hundred acres off my place and uh, started planting uh, Chardonnay, Shiraz and Cabernet. And we've since put in Malbec. Uh, we, and at the time we were given a, an eight year contract from Yolumba. We've, uh, we looked at our first Chardonnay we planted. We used a Yolumba clone, um, but there were two Yolumba clones that were considered by the winemakers as a better clone. So I think uh, people who are planting now are all looking towards research that's been done in the past and whatever works they're using. Big companies were offering good contracts and one stage uh, my wife and I were sitting at the table at the having an afternoon tea. We had four fellas turn up at the back door with suits on that looked like some evangelical mob at the back door and they came in and they said we've just had a meeting at Struan, Westpac it was, and we want you to plant vines. <laughs> so, so we thought, well, there must be something in it. We had probably some of the best land in the district anyway, in the Rattenbully district. We, we knew it was Terrarossa over limestone and, and um, that was what we needed. I worked for Ken for um, three years and loved it so much. And I decided that uh, I'd like to have a go myself. Um, learning how, because you know we helped establish the vineyard, so I felt a, exper the experience would be wonderful to do it myself. And uh, a friend of mine, Rosie Malone, she also was starting her own vineyard, so um, I went and worked for Rosie and helped her plant, which was great fun. Then after that, we put our own vineyard, and Rosie came and helped me plant my vineyard. We at home have um, Shiraz and Cabernet and um, as far as um, you know doing well with things I mean I know this region's supposed to be really good for Cabernet and it is and we have done well but we, we seem to with our own wine be doing quite well with the Shiraz as well. We're at home producing some A-grade fruit now which is terribly pleasing. We've gone in slowly and you know don't have a, a huge amount of wine but we're hoping if we you know in the future that we can you know build on that. First grapes sort of came out in 96 and 97 and people were trying to make branded products around this thing and make, the big issue was we didn't know what we were going to call the region and uh, we'd started off by the, the bulk of the people thought that you know, Copper Murrah was going to be the, the name that went, went forward and, and one of the members had a big issue with that and, and uh, stood in the way. 
of, of that moving forward. So by the time we'd got our final determination, we'd all agreed that we would run with Rat and Bully as a name. Us having Rat and Bully on the label is uh, one of the first steps in growing any region. You've got to have products of, uh, of what's out there. So you, you might be able to tell everyone that we grow fantastic grapes, but until they look at the wine and uh, they can touch and feel what we're actually making from Rat and Bully is when the region will really start to shine, I think. I think diversity here in Rat and Bully is one thing that I like to push a lot. Um, you know, recently at the Adelaide Wine Show, the uh, Rat and Bully had a, our Riesling was a, a trophy winner there, but also there was Cabernets from around this region which were up there as well. So it's uh, showing you know we can do reds and whites, and if we've got the right site selection and good vineyard management and good wine making, then we can grow pretty much anything we want. We're very fortunate to have a lot of vineyards. Uh, that are in in the area are, are separated rather than all um, joined together, and I think we're able to um, utilise that in our own, I suppose, small patch, and not be influenced by people right next to us who are perhaps not doing the type of things we're doing to keep our vineyard clean and and green, I guess. You had little pockets of vineyards in, in between a pocket of farming land and in between a pocket of native vegetation. And so it basically allowed the vineyards to be spread out. So two things, you haven't got a monoculture of, of vineyards in one spot. You've got less pest pressure because if someone next door in a, in a monoculture sort of region gets powdery mildew or gets another problem with their vineyard, it can very easily translate across the border into your vineyard. Here in Rattenbully, you've got one vineyard, about three or four kilometres down the road, you've got another vineyard. Not saying those things can't, jump over that distance but saying that there's less chance. Right here right now we're, we're seeing some really good parcels of fruit generated within the region. The vines are all somewhere between 14 to 20 years old. Uh, they've had enough time to balance down, they've been managed in a particular way for so long now that you're not getting these really random responses that you can get out of young vineyards and uh, you know, the, the wines are starting to stand up and speak for themselves. The year I left we actually got grapes into Penfolds, we got it into this bottle of 707 which is just next to the Grange and I reckon that's bloody good. I think it's exciting now seeing like Treasury, you know, they're getting you know some good fruit that's making 707 and St Henry's, um, you know, that's that's getting up pretty high and uh, they're putting a lot of work into those vineyards too which is great to see. But I think eventually it will get world recognition um, as the demand, you know, world demand for good wine and good food increases. I think places like Rat and Bully will, will become recognised. I never imagined that it would grow to this degree and um, it's so, it is so very exciting to see it.